up next on Small Town Big Deal. I was homeless for 15 years. Rebuilding broken lives through furniture. If I wasn't going to hire these guys, then who would? One man's mission to offer hope and a hand up. They can take a step back and say, wow, I built that. And gentlemen, start your engines for a red par <laughs> roundup. Welcome to Small Town Big Deal. We've traveled across the country and firmly believe that the people in small towns are the hands that keep America strong. So join us, Rodney Miller and Jan Carl, as we show you the great things these people do on Small Town Big Deal. Welcome to Small Town Big Deal. I'm Rodney Miller. And I'm Jan Carl. We are in Villa Rica, Georgia, which is about 30 miles west of Atlanta. And you know, Jan, we've told a lot of amazing stories, some really cool people, but today's story is truly remarkable. The name Villa Rica means rich town. And if wealth is measured in making a difference in people's lives, then the richest man in town is Brian Preston. Around here we say we give hand ups, not handouts. And it's really about allowing these guys uh, an opportunity to, to help themselves. Brian is the founder of Layman Luther. It's a company that builds furniture from reclaimed materials. For instance, this collection right here is a tree that fell in somebody's yard uh, after a storm. But the real mission is to reclaim lives. My name's T.C. Curtis. I was homeless for 15 years. They pulled me from being nothing to what I am now. When you're homeless, you depend on the dumpsters behind restaurants. That's a way of surviving. TC survived much of that time by living in a makeshift tent city deep in the Georgia woods. Can you tell us what your life was like? Yeah, because them creeks get awful cold in the wintertime. <laughs> How did TC end up working for Brian? Well, for years, Brian had a successful home building business, and then the bottom fell out. In 2008, we lost it all. We lost our house and our cars, and, and just everything came crashing down. It was good. For Brian, losing it all proved to be a revelation. It was kind of at that moment that I realized that I wanted to do something greater, you know, do something more in my life and uh, discovered these guys living in the woods and uh, wanted to try to figure out ways that I could help these guys. At first, that help came in the form of dropping off food and firewood. But then Brian, who had started building furniture as a hobby, had an epiphany. Hey, we could hire some of these guys to build this furniture. About a month later, he come up and asked me if I would want a job. And I said, of course, hell, all of us were wanting jobs. I just knew that if I wasn't going to hire these guys, then who would? Armed with nothing more than faith, some borrowed tools, and an old stack of lumber, Layman Luther was born that day in Brian's garage. Today, the company named for his grandfather occupies a 40,000 square foot warehouse. But more importantly, it has now given a hand up to so many men, all eager to rebuild their lives after years of addiction and homelessness. I lost my fiance, lost all my money, I wrecked my car. So I pretty much lost it all, including my family. I pushed my family away. They didn't want anything to do with me. So I found myself at the bottom, bottom of the, of the barrel. It was awful. Coming here, you know, there is a lot of hope and there is a lot of opportunity, and this it's, it's, it's been awesome. You want one? Thanks. This is reclaimed, so it came from a barn or a house? Or yes. So how exactly does Layman Luther work its magic? Watch how this old piece of lumber becomes a beautiful table. Can I help? Oh, yeah. You think I'm good enough to help? As long as you don't hit your finger with a hammer. So, TC, we got to get all these nails out? Yeah. We got have a metal detector. Well, that's just too cool. We never had anything like that when I was growing up. And it? This is pretty simple work. Yeah. Hey, Jan. Yeah. Yeah. Hey. So we're clear up to there. There's another one. You got all those down there? Once the nails are all out, it's over to the planer. The main thing is your eye protection because the wood 
flies around on the planers. Okay. And it is very noisy. Find your thickest piece, which will be an inch and a quarter. We'll come in and set our planer down to an inch and a quarter. All right, you start with your thick one. You want to start with this one? Yeah. You want to keep it always level. From there, the newly minted planks are ready to become a tabletop. You were asking how they get boards like this together. Right. I know they use glue, but that just doesn't seem like yeah. enough. It's not. There's one of these in there about every foot. They're called biscuits. Okay, and then you'd, oh, look at that! You do that every foot. And then you put glue on here, too, and then you clamp them together and let them set for four or five hours. That's it? That's it. The finished table is nothing short of spectacular. That's beautiful. Nice work, guys. Yeah. So what's really cool then is, even though this looks brand new, it's like very, very old the wood is. Right. And you just run it to that planer and it makes it look new. That's right. So could you do that same thing for Jan and I? <laughs> I was like, wait a minute, where is this going? Yeah, I just need a little planing around the crow's feet and... I think I need more than you, so... Yeah, I think he needs extra time. <laughs> Lehman Luther's success continues to grow. It's now carried by such retailers as Pottery Barn and Williams Sonoma. And the company was also featured for the first time at the prestigious High Point Market. Can you put it in there pretty? Okay. There you go. Good job. Brian's wife, April, says her husband isn't just building a business. He's building a community, one life at a time. These guys are family to us. They eat at our dining room table. We have dinner with them once a week at least. I've done their dirty laundry from Tent Village in my washing machine. <laughs> you know, they come over for Thanksgiving because they don't have family to do Thanksgiving with. Come in 18. 18. We just want to create meaningful work for these guys and, and jobs that mean something to them. And furniture does that. It's taking old broken wood that is full of nails. You know, and it's very symbolic to the guys that we hire because I think society views both as garbage or trash. But when we bring them into this place and, and we take those materials and we take these men and we allow them to create this art, this furniture, they can take a step back and say, wow, I built that. I created that from nothing and now it's something and it's something that can last forever. Coming up next on Small Town Big Deal. <laughs> a crimson tide rolls into South Dakota for the 25th annual Red Power Roundup. And then meet the new king and queen of the Corn Palace. If there's a little kernel of truth. In I'm all ears. <laughs> Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal. You're looking at the world's largest ringtail pheasant, located here in Huron, South Dakota. Now, the world's largest pheasant is a pretty big deal, but there's something else happening this weekend that's also a big deal. Yeah, I think it's a pretty big deal. It's probably tripled the population of Huron, and it's Red Par Roundup. Get ready for some fun. The South Dakota State Fairgrounds became a sea of red tractors last summer as close to 20,000 people turned out over three days to celebrate International Harvest. Demonstrators, I think those are cool. You know, so I'm pretty much an IH guy from way back. I mean, I grew up on them. My dad and my uncle both farmed with them and later worked for the company. So they're really in my blood. So you can imagine how special this event is to me. Beautiful <laughs> It's a chance for both collectors and fans of this iconic American company to get together and share their passion for Big Red. Here we go. All right. Wow. Look at all those. Since I'm the new kid on the block here at Red Power, I thought it was best if I kind of took a back seat. <laughs> you take a back seat? Oh, not, yes. And see if the master could impress me with his knowledge. Oh, <laughs> really? How's that? Okay, let's just consider it like a speed round in a game show. 
at H. That was the first tractor I drove, 140. Gosh, with a one-arm bandit, an MT8, and a 766 Farm on an M, and a Super C, and a 140, and a 240, another rare one, a C, a Super M. Wow, I have to admit, that was impressive. He is the master. <laughs> wow, I could, I could get used to that. <laughs> don't. Master? Okay, don't even. <laughs> when it comes to the roundup, credit is due this man, Clyde Berkshire, a longtime IH dealer. He founded the event back in 1989. A grand total of 24 tractors were on hand, but this year, over 2,000. So Clyde, I have a question. If you know somebody who loves International Harvester and they've never been to a Red Power Roundup, what would you say to them? You would never know what I'd say to them. <laughs> Apparently, we cannot put that on camera. Around the same time Clyde was born, this 1922 IH 1530 rolled off the line and began its lifetime of work. Well, we'll see if it'll go. Jason Sweeter found it battered and broken and painstakingly restored it to its former glory. We ended up picking it up from a friend of ours in North Dakota, brought it home, took it apart, and got it running again. You know, all that history is in good hands because there is a whole new generation of folks who love and appreciate those proud old machines just like I do. I found my great grandpa's F20 and I restored it and it got me started restoring internationals and here I am today. Teenage collector Austin Miller already has nine tractors, including... 51M diesel, a 51M, a 41H, and I'm right now restoring a 1953 Category 2 Super M. And so that young man is off to a really good start. And trust me, I speak from just a little too much experience. Because how many <laughs> tractors do you have? Hey, you don't count them. That just gets you in trouble. That means he's got a lot. For longtime collectors like me, every issue of Red Power Magazine is a must read. Well, my favorite section is the classifieds because I read every one of them. Every I'm always looking for a bargain, you know, or something, that piece I don't have, or... You start in the back. Oh, always, <laughs> always. Okay, so it's kind of my favorite, too, you know? Okay. But the love of Red Power isn't limited to only those who call the U.S. of A home. This group traveled to South Dakota from France just to make the show. When you go home, what will you tell everyone in France that collects tractors about Red Power Roundup? We are like uh, kids uh, for Christmas, you know. <laughs> you know we have, uh, <laughs> that would be Maybe so we'll do fun. a small town big deal episode in France. Yeah, yeah. It could be a big deal. And we can uh, show you. <laughs> Natalie has a 200 collect tractor collection. She has 200 yeah. tractors? Yes. Returns. Wow. <laughs> I'm impressed. Wow. But the long distance award goes to Malcolm and Wayne from Australia. They traveled over 9,000 miles to get here. You could go all the way to Australia and do a story on a little town where a tractor guy lives. I'm telling you. <laughs> and I'm, I'm known as a local collector because I'm the only one in town that's a collector. Ah. So people bring their junk to me. And... Perfect. So you're a big deal in that small town. That's it. I guess so. I never <laughs> thought of that. I could start a show. Malcolm says yes. Yeah. Oh. Getting a chance to be the host city for the Roundup can do wonders for a small town's economy. Oh, it's got to be huge. Got to be huge. And we always appreciate that. We use that tax money to, of course, put things back into our city. So we, we really do want to thank you guys and all the people who promoted this show. And we hope we do a good job and that you come back. And one family that's been coming back for years, my good friend who we've had lots of fun with through the years, the Bodine family from Alabama. To me, Red Power is special because it's friendships like this that we bring all of us together. We get to see people from all over the country who farm and love what we love, and we get to spend time with them and share stories, and just really it's about the people. Come on, man, I've been waiting for this for a year. <laughs> and for me, like that guy, it's also about great-grandma Faye Bodine. <laughs> That's because she makes a bunch of her famous sour cream pound cakes. For anybody who wants a slice, or two. Or three. I'll just take care of this. Where would you like me to put this? <laughs> would I just, yeah, I can just put this just away for you. Just don't share it with Rodney, okay? <laughs> no, no, he can't have sugar. Oh, he can't have sugar. Rodney. Thanks. All right, see you, Dan. <laughs> really have that farming heritage and love farming, and I'm very passionate about farming. Rodney and I were honored to get a chance to speak at the show. And for me, being a first-timer, 
I can see how it really is about the people and the lifelong bonds that are formed here. I said he was my hero. Oh, yeah. And coming up... Oh, my gosh! We've got the most anvil shooting, six-gun riding, cowboy dragon, corn tooting, watermelon seed spitting fun you'll see anywhere on TV. <laughs> That's when we return. You're watching Small Town Big Deal. I've taught you everything you know about tractors. I just haven't taught, taught you everything, everything I, I know. know. <laughs> Welcome back to Small Town Big Deal from the Red Power Roundup in Huron, South Dakota. You know, that header's so big, we almost need a golf cart to get from one side of it to the other. This is huge. You know, for lovers of all things I age, like me, being up to my ears in red tractors is heaven on earth. This brings back a lot of memories. But there are a few other things going on at the state fairgrounds here that got our attention. Oh my gosh! Like watching our very first anvil shoot. <laughs> you know, that was like nothing I've ever seen before. Whoa. I've seen it many times before. And there was also the local rodeo with events like cowboy mounted shooting and a horseback version of drag racing. Billy! Your fruit of the looms are going to get full of dirt. Oh, Billy! Yeah! But if you ever find yourself near Huron, you have got to make the short trip down to Mitchell, South Dakota. There is a certain row crop farmer that I know that would love to call this place home. Hey, who wouldn't want to live in a corn palace? It's safe to say there is nothing like it anywhere. A 45,000 square foot arena covered in murals made of nothing but corn. When you see someone come here for the first time mm -hmm. and they've never seen the murals, mm -hmm. can you describe what their reaction is? You know, they look up, they see the scope, they see the intricacy of some of these designs, the level of detail, the stories that we're able to tell through this beautiful folk art. And where else would you ever do this? But Mitchell, South Dakota, the world's only corn palace. It all began back in 1892 when a group of local realtors came up with the idea in hopes of attracting new settlers to the area to farm its rich soil. So I'm a farm boy raised corn my whole life, so I'm just curious, how many ears of corn are on the walls inside and outside? You know, the exterior murals, we use about 275,000 ears of corn every year. Well, let me see, that's 275,000 ears divided by 48. That's 5,729 bushels of corn. Explain the process. Well, they start in June with the grains and grasses. They tie them up in bundles. And then they use an air gun and they staple it to the building. That work will take all of June, July, and August to do. Then while the corn's growing, the artist draws their pictures onto black roofing paper to the scale up on the sides of the building. Then they hand pick each ear of corn that goes up. They use a table saw, cut it in half like you would a banana for a split, and they nail that flat edge to that black roofing paper. This is last year's corn. You can see how the birds have messed with it. The theme changes each year, and special varieties of corn are selected for their specific color. Sherry Ramsdale is the Corn Palace designer. When it's all done, and you stand back and look at it, how do you feel? Proud most times. Sometimes a little disappointed because, you know, I have a vision in my head and it didn't turn out the way I thought, and sometimes I'm super excited because it's way better than I anticipated, so. But usually relief that it actually worked out. <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of tourists visit each year, making the Corn Palace one of South Dakota's most popular destinations. And the best part, there's absolutely no charge to get in. I'm also impressed that it's free. Yeah, uh, nothing's I mean, free anymore. Nothing's free anymore. <laughs> you know, spend a couple bucks, buy some popcorn while we're here, and we'll call it even <laughs> at our corn session she stand. She will buy popcorn before we leave, I guarantee <laughs> you. At the corn session stand. <laughs> you know, it was only a matter of time before the puns got corny. Some of us live in a permanent state of corn fusion around here. Yeah. I'm a cornucopia of corn palace knowledge. <laughs> and she's the queen of corny jokes, so she's going to really enjoy it. I am. We're currently under corn instruction. <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. If there's a little kernel of truth. I'm all ears. <laughs> it really was amazing. You see what I did there? Did you get it? Amazing. I got it. Well, let's get back to the roundup. Now, wait a minute. So is this the newest, latest, greatest? This is pretty much it. Go up in it. Yeah? Oof. Yeah. Okay. There's a jacuzzi in here. <laughs> 
And with so much to see and do, it's easy to work up an appetite. And one of my favorite traditions every year is getting together with good friends for a little afternoon snack. And here, that means watermelon. Yeah. All right, okay, let's, let's do it, let's go for it. This year's batch made the trip up to South Dakota all the way from Louisiana. I have never seen a yellow watermelon. Does it taste different? Not at all. Devouring a cool, juicy slice or two with friends and sharing some laughs is as much a part of what Red Pyre is about as the tractors. And besides, where else are you going to see Jan in a seed spitting contest? She's a pretty good spitter. Yeah, come on, spit to it. See if you can hit the cameraman. Come on. Oh, not bad. Hey, wait a minute. I, I thought we weren't going to air that. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Here's to you, Big Red. See you next time. You know, from the first day I met Rodney, he has talked about Red Power Roundup, and now I know why. It's a really cool show. Well, you know, I'm glad you got to experience it. But, you know, I think you've also seen that it's not just about the equipment, but it's about the stories and the people behind that equipment and how much it means to them. And they're preserving history, for sure. Yeah, and we both love that. And I got this from one of our fans. Oh, that was really The most sweet. adorable little boy, thank you. He was the cutest thing. And what about the Corn Palace? Can you believe back in 1890, some marketing genius thought of putting corn on the outside of the building and thousands and thousands and thousands of people would go see it? And obviously, you brought some corn from there. It's so good. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, so you want me to close the show? Okay, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Small Town Big Deal. I'm Rodney Miller, and she's Jan Carl. Join us again next week when once again we celebrate the great stories from across America. For anybody who wants a slice, or two. Or three. <laughs> you had three. <laughs> you have to be nice, not naughty, to get something for Christmas. So, what are you saying? <laughs> Don't beat around the bush, just say it. You just got be a little nicer, that's all. <laughs>